This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. A gang that terrorized an entire city. Born in prisons. And unleashed on the streets. Everywhere we go, we just, people just, like, we're terrified. Los Salidos, the solid ones. When you're solid, it's a bond, a life. Their agenda, total domination by any means necessary. They fear no one. But the police department was just overwhelmed. Welcome to Hartford, the unlikely place where Los Salidos rule. Violence is part of their lifestyle. It's part of their overhead. It's what they do. People willing to kill and die for the colors 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Connecticut. In a state with the highest per capita income, its capital is one of its poorest cities. Hartford has about 120,000 residents. Of those, hundreds claim Los Salidos, solid ones. Salidos basically comes off of being a solid warrior. That's why it's called solid ones. True solid ones, TSO. Solid forever, forever solid. Their huge illegal empire rakes in volumes of cash to keep the gang running. Their biggest money makers, narcotics. Everything, marijuana, heroin, uh, cocaine, uh, wet. Los Salidos lists of crimes range from car thefts to prostitution and shakedowns. They're also notorious for their ruthlessness. People respected us, feared us. If you mess with us, we're gonna take it to y'all. Herman, AKA Big Bird, was a Salidos enforcer. His role was to ensure the gang members followed the rules. I stood in my area, post people up. Let them know what to hang in case, you know, rival gangs, the police come. Herman joined the Salidos as a teenager. The violence was a release from an otherwise tortured existence. Because my father wasn't there for me, so I had much anger. And, you know, I used to love to fight. Though Herman was attracted to violence, his size and love of nature earned him an unlikely street name, Big Bird. People looked on me because I was big. And you know, I was a person that liked to go to the woods and hear the animals, look at the trees, look at the birds. Like, wow, this is incredible. The similarities to the popular childhood character ended there. I didn't start things, but I'll finish them. Joining the Salidos is a rite of passage for many Hispanic males within the city's barrio. My brothers, a uh, couple nephews, uncles, they were all Solidos. So for me to go any other way other than Solido would have been treason. Many, like Jordan, who asked to have his identity concealed, are drawn by the lure of easy money. Jordan was recruited when he was 14 years old. He made as much as $1,000 a day selling drugs before he was old enough to have a driver's license. Once I became a gang member, I was able, I was able to afford those things. Clothes, shoes, sneakers, um, money just to go in the store, buy whatever I wanted. At 15 years old, I had a $20,000 car. Others joined Los Salidos for more personal reasons. Ron Nazario grew up in the sand, a housing project on Hartford's north side, known for its poverty and violence. His mother 
was a gangbanger and into drugs, both using and dealing. I've seen my mom fight men. She would stab you in a heartbeat. You know, she had a gun, she'd shoot you in a heartbeat. He claims his father was even more frightening. He stabbed my stepmother a couple of times in front of all of us. And I, and I remember him punching me in the chest. You know, when he got angry, it was terrifying. Iran and his brother Efren were often forced to live in parks or on the streets. We used to jump off garbage cans to have fun, <laughs> jumping off and flipping. And there'd probably be a mattress there or a mat, and we'd flip off the garbage cans on top of it. Iran picked up his nickname, Smurf, because he always wore blue to match his jeans, the only pair of pants he owned. At nine, he joined his first gang, a small set called the GQs. By 13, he dropped out of school and began a relationship with a 24-year-old woman. Soon, he moved in with her. She kind of helped me find that comfort level she wanted me to work, so I got a job working construction, picking up bricks. He also started picking up arrests, mostly for assaults on his girlfriend. When the woman didn't listen to you, you beat her up. That's what my dad did. You know, that's what I did. Iran moved in and out of detention homes for several years. When he was 17, he caught his girlfriend with another man and landed in Manson Youth Correctional Institute for assault. I threw him out a third story window and I stabbed her four times and I went to jail for that. Now, he was in the big leagues. You never seen these kind of guys. It's just a whole different atmosphere. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're terrified. On his first day, another inmate challenged him. I fought him until the guards came and helped me out. Because he was going to eventually bet he was too, too big for me. So eventually he was going to he was going to hurt me. Smurf did his time. 15 months. He found big changes when he got back to the streets. Gang bangers that were former enemies were suddenly hanging out with each other. These guys were at each other all these years and they're all together, what's going on? The word on the street was that a new gang was forming. He knew something was changing, something was happening, so everybody was getting together, it was getting big fast. It all became clear when Smurf landed back in prison, this time for assault. There, he was initiated into the new gang, Los Salidos. He gained a new family, and the Solids gained a brilliant new face. They knew that I was the kind of person who knew the neighborhood, that I could benefit from having a family like them. Smurf was a mastermind. He was, he was actually one of the smartest individuals that this family has come across. Back on the streets, he would need his wits in 1993 when one of his closest friends got himself in trouble with a rival gang. August 31st, Hartford. Smurf had spent the day at a pool party and was trying to reach his fellow Salido, Pipe Santana. I was paging him because I wanted him to come over there. Uh, there were a lot of people and some good looking girls and uh, I knew that he would have a good time. Pipe was already busy. He was having an affair with the girlfriend of the leader of the ruthless Latin Kings, the undeniable rulers of Hartford streets. The Kings didn't tolerate disobedience and had already warned Pipe to back off, but he wasn't hearing it. They got into words over her uh, and eventually got into fist fight. I think Pipe got the better of the other guy. The law of the streets demanded revenge. Two gang members trailed Pipe as he bought a beer at the neighborhood liquor store. His brother, Waneka, also a Salido since 1991, describes what happened next. My brother was about this area here, sitting on a milk crate right about here somewhere. And the two guys confronted her coming out from that street right there, Seymour Street came this way, and they were talking, like right about here somewhere. And as they were talking like this. 
Felipe did not see the third Latin king. The other guy came from the side of a building, crept up, and from close range shot him in the back. The Latin kings showed no mercy. The bullet turned him around, and then they took off running. Felipe's brother was at home when a Salido brought him the news. And I just kept telling him, no, you crazy? No way. Not my, my brother, you crazy? Not Pete. You know, ain't no way. It's impossible. I remember I grabbed my, um, my toy. I ran out the house. Waneka ran to the liquor store where a crowd of Salidos was gathering. Bebe. We were gasping for air, and we were waiting for the ambulance. Like, where the ambulance? Where the F the ambulance at? Smurf, one of Los Salido's highest-ranking leaders, also got word of Pipe shooting. He knew what was about to go down. Once I heard the news, I knew that it was war. The incident between the two gangs exploded into a full-scale gang war that would take Hartford by storm. Yeah, there was a retaliation of not even a half an hour after that happened. You know, I mean, all you heard was gunshots everywhere. Everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere. Hartford, the capital city of the Constitution State. Street gangs are nothing new here, but since the 1980s, they have become widespread organized and dangerous this area that we're going down right now is is again still controlled by the los salidos we get down to broad street you're going to find it's latin king territory down there los salidos or the solid ones a violent street gang fueled by money guns and drugs control much of the city if you were messed with or one of ours was messed with there would be how to pay Los Salidos formed in Connecticut state prisons in the late 1980s. The capital is only the third largest city in the state. And Hartford gangsters were targeted by others from Bridgeport and New Haven. They realized they could not stand on their own as a separate street gang. There were too many gangs inside the prison, too many established, very powerful prison gangs. A Hartford inmate named Lawrence Bouvet, LB had a vision of a multiracial super gang that could dominate both in the prisons and on the streets. LB, who was serving time for rape, became the brains behind the Salidos. Gang members would call him the Godfather. LB was a, uh, a very powerful individual. Uh, he, he carried a lot of weight. He had done a lot of time. He had some escape stuff on his past. He, um, you know, he was the kind of guy that, you know, nobody in the prison system messed with. Michael LaJoy, a corrections officer at Connecticut's maximum security Summers Prison, was an eyewitness to the Godfather's growing power. He got everybody to buy into his culture, and he got everybody to buy into um, what was going on. Everybody's kind of listening to him, and everybody's rolling with him, and all our boys are getting down with it. The Godfather was shrewd. He first earned the respect of the established Hispanic gang, the Latin Kings, by asking their permission to start Los Salidos. So it was just like everybody's together. We're a family. We protect each other. Uh, if you have problems with somebody, you have problems with the Latin Kings. Under the Godfather's leadership, Los Salidos and the Latin Kings were tight. The kings even took to calling the solid ones cousins. Latin kings and the Solidos got along fine, so we're gonna take care of y'all. But when the time is right, when the Latin kings, when we go to war, y'all gonna have to be there for. With the Latin king's blessing, Bouffe built up the Solidos. He drafted a gang charter heavy on responsibility and discipline. Everything that you're going to do as a member, from attending meetings to paying dues, all the way down to your personal hygiene. The Godfather ruled with an iron fist, and the Salidos followed. One new inmate who owed them big drug money found that out the hard way. 
They went right after him, right in the chow hall. They basically made some noise so the people started looking and they just stabbed him as many times as they could. When you stab an inmate in a busy chow hall, you're telling everyone, it doesn't matter where you cross us, we'll get you. The Salitos were smart and figured out ways to do business, including drug deals on the outside. Even though the prison staff read their mail and monitored phone calls, the Solids managed to beat the system. If they had to use five people and send letters to five different addresses to finally get a letter to a certain person, they were so organized that they could easily do that. They also used ingenious coded messages to evade the authorities' attention. They would do letter formations where, where you know, every third letter would be the actual letter that they did to put in the next, you know, sentence to a, to a word. As soon as they caught wind, that somehow law enforcement uh, intercepted that letter, you know, they would change their codes right away. By 1991, the gang's numbers were growing dramatically, inside and on the streets. They were recruiting daily. They were recruiting outside middle schools, recruiting outside high schools. They were getting people coming out of jail, joining their fold. The Godfather took the lead as Los Salidos developed a strict hierarchy with a president, vice president, and a secretary treasurer. Below them were the warlords. A warlord would oversee the missions of violence against other gangs, delinquent drug dealers, even fellow Salidos who broke gang rules. He would basically get the reports on what's going on. So he would make sure that every chapter within Hartford was running tip top. Enforcers carried out the warlord's orders. They also kept the soldiers, the gang's core membership, in line and settled individual disputes. It's a very organized structure. They've had, you know, from a president on down to their soldiers, and when one person steps down or is removed from that position, they've got the next person right in line to take over. They would be similar to a mafia group in that, you know, they, they had their, their lead structure, they had their soldiers, they had their warriors, they had their people who would take care of business for them. Modeling themselves after the Mafia, Los Salidos also called themselves the family. Bouvet, the godfather, called the shots from prison, but shared power with the gang's officers on the street and other senior leaders. This elite governing group was known simply as the committee. The godfather could say, well, we're going to war, but if the committee said, you know what, we don't feel we should go to war, we can, we can piece it up, let's go this route. He would have to do that. Bouvet groomed his leaders carefully. In the early 1990s, he appointed Jorge Rivera, a.k.a. Bacchino, as president. Bouvet, serving an 18-year sentence, needed a presence on the streets to make sure Los Salidos were as solid in Hartford as they were in the state's prisons. Bacchino emerged as a powerful force within Los Salidos. He was as dangerous as John Gotti was or anybody in, in that power in that position because at a drop of a dime, he could have you assassinated or killed. Bacchino had a long rap sheet that included drug dealing and possession. He was an imposing presence with a sharp mind. He could have a meeting with you uh, 15 weeks ago, and he would remember that like it happened yesterday, detail for detail. Iran Nazario, AKA Smurf, was often with Bacchino. After becoming a member of Los Salidos at the age of 21, Smurf moved quickly up the ranks, becoming the gang's treasurer and public face. He was very convincing, he was very media savvy, and he was smart. Smurf went on TV, did interviews, and portrayed Los Salidos as good citizens, caretakers of Hartford's Hispanic community. There will be an increase in crime because these kids won't know they're committing these crimes sometimes under this, this new drug. Their mission was to recruit as many members to get to that goal that was in the charter, which was to keep us safe, to help the community. The Hartford PD saw right through it. A spokesman for a gang who's articulate and smart and can portray this criminal organization in a, in a positive manner is more dangerous than the biggest thug on the street. The gang's true intent was to dominate Hartford. Though mostly Hispanic, Los Salidos openly recruited other races and ethnic groups. We're going to accept anybody that, that wants to be a member and that can prove himself. 
black, white, Chinese, it doesn't matter. By 1992, Los Salidos outnumbered the powerful Latin kings, but they still had to share the same streets. An intense rivalry began to simmer between these former allies. We live not even like two blocks away, so we usually see them almost every day. We know a lot of kings that are family members. We was real tight. We used to hang together, hang out, drink, chill, you know. Los Salidos, at one time viewed as little cousins by the Latin kings, were now the more powerful and violent gang. The Latin kings weren't about to let go of their stranglehold on the streets of Hartford without a fight. Los Salidos were pushing the Latin kings out of every corner uh, because they were more violent, they had more members, and they, they protected their interests a lot more. The Latin kings were basically getting jealous because they weren't the one in power no more. And the Solidos, everything they have, they got it from us, all right? And now they're trying to be more powerful than everybody else, and they're not. The former allies began to openly clash with increasing violence. It was petty things, like, what are you looking at? And what the f are you bumping into me for? What are you bumping into me for? What? What do you, what'd you say to me? Let's go. And before you know it, they're fighting. A battle was brewing between Los Salidos and the Latin Kings, with Hartford caught in the middle. It was like the Confederacy and the Union Army. They are instant enemies, right there. Hartford, Connecticut, 1992. Once protected by the Latin Kings, Los Salidos, or the Solid Ones, were now the strongest and most feared street gang in the city. You're walking down the street, like wherever the Solid's rule, you feel a sense of power that I can't even explain. Los Salidos were brazenly taking over Hartford and running their illegal empire with mob-like efficiency. In one instance, they used their cars to openly block off a main street while they went after a rival drug dealer. They found them, they beat them up, uh, spread the word that Lawrence Street was their territory and that anyone else could operate without either becoming a member or paying tribute to the gang. Anybody got, got in their way was dealt with, maybe with threats, maybe with bribery, maybe with a beatdown, maybe getting shot. Hartford police were outmanned, outgunned, and overwhelmed. The city's homicide rate was climbing and soon reached its highest level in years. That was three nights span where it was absolute pandemonium. Uh, shots being fired up and down this stretch and all the way down on the next block. A guy would take out guns and start shooting in the air, like broad daylight, like they were in some war-torn country. That's brazen, just didn't care. Bam, 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 just shooting guns. For years, officials had denied they had a serious gang problem. That was no longer possible. The public was sick and tired of this uh, nonstop violence, and, and these guys were in the face of the public. They're gonna do what they wanted, despite what anyone said. In June 1992, the police department created its first gang task force under Sergeant Chris Lyons. His team had little to work with. A typewriter or two, um, one vehicle, and a small office for a sergeant and five, five officers. Inadequate um, resources for that job. Los Salidos seemed on top of the world. They had out-of-state bank accounts and a long list of criminal enterprises. They would steal cars, chop them up in the, in the, in the woods, and then ship the parts out as, as one of their major activities. The gang also ran prostitution rings and hired themselves out as protection for other drug kingpins, escorting the dealers around the state. Their ammo was to have either two cars in front and two cars behind. That way, if any state troop or any police officer would attempt to uh, pull this vehicle over, they would create a distraction and, and therefore create a car chase. Los Salidos' biggest moneymaker, though, was the sale of cocaine and crack. It was heady income for young gangbangers. Estimate one month, uh, you probably make $150,000, $200,000 uh, for the family. The money 
that you get from McDonald's and Woody's, they're gonna cut it. You can't pay your rent with that. You know, you can't live the way you want to. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I sold drugs. And, you know, I ain't proud of it, but it's something I had to do. Los Salidos developed an ingenious method for running drugs across state lines. They owned small U-Haul business out of state. They would pick stuff up, money, drugs, guns, bootleg clothing, whatever it may be, and just basically hide them inside secret panels inside the U-Haul trucks. The shipments would come through several times a week. They can make secret compartments in the trailers, in the seats, in the tires, the rims, the wheels. The dogs would come through and you wouldn't detect nothing. The Salidos were rock solid, thriving under what is still their main principle. The main rule for them was protect your brother Los Salido members or your sister Los Salido members. Always, uh, if you see a Salido member in a fight, you have to assist them. Los Salidos represent by wearing their colors, red and blue. Blue is for the body and red is for the blood that has been shed. Bandanas and beads are also part of the dress code. You saw them together, one half is red, one half is blue. You, you could easily spot us from miles away with those beads or the handkerchiefs. A member's rank determines his beads. The president will probably have a bunch of red with some, some dots of blue. The vice president would have probably less red and different dots. A warlord probably have more red and blue. Getting inked is mandatory for Los Salidos members. Their trademark tattoos are the comedy and tragedy theater masks. That's what we based our, our beliefs around. Good times in life and the bad times in life. Like most gangs, those chosen to join Los Salidos go through a short and brutal ritual called a bounce. I had to get jumped in by two other guys. Bigger, one bigger than me and one Irish to my size in order for me to become a member. I had to fight two of them for approximately two minutes, hand-to-hand -hand combat. After about a minute, maybe, maybe a minute, give or take, I was unconscious. I woke up, the next thing I can remember, I had guys hugging me and throwing, throwing bandanas on me and, you know, put some ice packs on my face and told me, you are now a brother for life. Once someone joins Los Salidos, he has the right to use their handshake. It's left over, right, and you go like this twice. They also learn Los Salidos code words, a special language only the gang understands. 45 was the number you would use to basically show your brother love. You had to find a way to acknowledge one another, without bringing any heat or drama to itself. So 45 was basically the way to do it. RV Hood had a different slang, depending on where you were from. TSO was the solid one, the solid ones. You're about to be teed, which was you're about, you're gonna be terminated. One member, Big Bird, even has his own set of signals to warn his brothers. One of them is for introduction, that's this one. The other one is to let them know I'm around. The other one is to let people know that alert, it's just our soldiers. With its laws in place, Los Salidos seemed unstoppable in the summer of 1993. They feared nothing, not the Latin Kings, and certainly not the undermanned Hartford gang unit. Toledo's shooting here, they're shooting there. We would go to the south end for shots fired. And once we were there, there were shots fired in the north end, and, and we were just running all over. The city was teetering on the edge of chaos, and it would get worse before it would get better. August 31st, 1993. A gang war between Los Salidos, the Solid Ones, and the Latin Kings was gathering force in Hartford. The reason was simple, revenge. Most of the wars were started over women. 
someone sleeping with some of the girlfriend. In this case, Pipe Santana, a high-ranking member of Los Salidos, was having an affair with the girlfriend of the president of the Latin Kings. Pipe was ambushed by the Kings, then shot once at close range. He died almost instantly. That's the reason he died, because he was so close up that it exploded his lungs, you know? Los Salidos president, Jorge Pequino Rivera, called an emergency gang meeting. He was in tears, and he just said, it's a declaration of war. They're going, and we're going. It's all green, you know, green light. Let's go. It was like horror on the street. They went out shooting Latin kings throughout the city. I mean, just like all hell broke loose. Los Salidos took time out from their street war to honor Pipe. Hundreds attended his funeral, which spilled from the church onto the streets of Hartford. He had a presidential funeral. He was real special. The procession made its way from the church to the cemetery. We was hollering, we love you, Peep, you know, you're still with us, you know. Uh, people out the windows and all around the street was like a parade. The peaceful moment didn't last long. Los Salidos were hell-bent on making the Latin Kings pay, and the city was caught in the crossfire. People going by on bicycles, people going by in cars, whatever, walking, they didn't even need an order. They didn't care. Their primary object was to take out a king. The king's primary object was to take out a solid. The shots rang out night after night. Finally, the Hartford PD called for backup. They had to bring in state police. They had to bring in other town agencies to cover the calls for service that Hartford cops weren't taking because they were here or in the North End putting out shootings and fights. It was just crazy. I don't think we got home for a couple hours a night. The war between the gangs peaked a few weeks later on Thanksgiving weekend. Within 12 hours, there were three drive-by murders. Two victims were Latin kings, including one whose brother was a member of the Salidos. Disgraceful. Kid had information his brother was going to be killed, didn't warn him, didn't tell him. The third victim was an innocent bystander, a 17-year-old who happened to be standing next to some Latin kings. This kid wasn't a gang-affiliated guy, and he got killed. The police were arresting gangsters as fast as they could, but it didn't stop the madness. They had their own bondsmen, they had funds for bonds, and they had their own attorneys. Los Salidos also had their public face, Smurf. While they targeted Latin kings, Smurf gave interviews, trying to spin their role. I was in the media, my face was everywhere. Everyone knew who I was. So every minute you spend looking at a face, you don't know if that's the face that's gonna end your life. Smurf became a prime target. One afternoon, a Latin king pulled a gun on him and his three-month-old daughter. He put the gun to her face and he said, what if I shoot your little bitch? And I said, yo, please don't do that. Yo, please, man, she ain't got nothing to do with that. So uh, he hit her in the face with the gun and laughed at me, and, uh, and he, he walked away. The child wasn't seriously injured. The gunman wasn't so lucky. He made some phone calls and uh, determined to kill him. He had to die for what he did. And the end, somebody else got him. Somebody else killed him. Ran up on him, and he lost his life. By 1994, the bedlam in Hartford was national news. The city finally asked the federal government to step in. The feds agreed. The FBI, DEA, and ATF joined with city and state police to go after Los Salidos, using laws first passed to fight the mafia. They pursued a RICO case, uh, federal racketeering against the Los Salidos. The task force began building its RICO case with warrants, wiretaps, and surveillance. They needed to prove that Los Salidos were a criminal organization that used illegal behavior to achieve their goals. The case took on new urgency on March 26, 1994. Seven-year-old Marcelina Delgado and her family were in their car when shots rang out. And so Solidos were shooting at Nine Kings. 
And when they came around the bluff corner where there's a blind spot, her car, her, her parents' car were coming in the opposite direction. They caught a straight bullet in the car. Los Salidos had mistaken Marcelina's father for a Latin king and opened fire on his car. He was wounded, but recovered. One bullet hit Marcelina in the head while she slept. The little girl died three days later. It was an accident, but a tragic one that shouldn't have occurred. Hartford and the country were outraged. I'm sick and tired of every week picking up the newspaper and seeing that one of our young people was dead again for a gang-related shooting. That incident just completely turned the table. The feds ramped up their investigation. The task force installed wiretaps for Los Salidos leaders, including its president, Bacino Rivera. And he was actually recorded on, a, on many calls, uh, talking about everything from the kidnapping to narcotics dealing. In October 1994, the task force brought down the hammer. Over the next 14 months, they charged more than 50 members of Los Salidos and their known associates for a laundry list of crimes, including drugs and racketeering. Murders, kidnappings, assaults, or also robberies. In May 1996, gang president Jorge Pequino Rivera and five other Salidos went to trial on racketeering charges. Included in the indictment were the 1993 Thanksgiving weekend killings and the 1994 murder of Marcelina Delgado. George Rivera was aiding and abetting or directing others to do the murders. The court sentenced Rivera to 13 consecutive life terms. In 1997, Smurf, the gang's spokesman and treasurer, was charged with accessory for providing money to a suspect in a killing. After a mistrial, he pled guilty to two counts of concealing a felony. Smurf was sentenced to 18 months. That's what jail was for me. It was like a trap for yourself. You know, you have no choice but to kind of explode with anger and rage. By 1997, the feds had sent more than 50 members of Los Salidos to jail. For the first time, the fate of the solids hung in the balance. The feds and the state troopers and police started raiding all the projects and started taking people down for racketeering. Basically, they were trying to get rid of anything and everyone to do with gangs. It has been more than a decade since the feds gutted the leadership of Los Salidos in Hartford, Connecticut. The Godfather, Larry Bouvet, and ex-gang president, Paquino Rivera, are in prison, where they will remain for many years. Even so, the gang is making a comeback, trying to rebuild its empire. The Salidos are going to be around. There's always going to be problems. They're always going to be into illegal stuff. And, and, it's, and they adapt to time very well. You know, they're very smart. And the police departments can never rest on their laurels and think that they did a good job and these guys are never coming back. Street gangs do not go away. Many of the gangsters locked up by the 1990s RICO convictions are being paroled and hitting the streets. They're going right back to where they were, right back to where they were comfortable, probably unrepentant. Plus, they're older, less employable than ever. Are they really going to go straight? I doubt it. And every time they went to jail, they learned how to be better gang members because they learned from our investigations how to avoid us. The illegal drug trade is bigger and more profitable than ever. These gangs have gone into selling uh, GHB, ecstasy, uh, amyl nitrate, maybe. A lot of club drugs, Viagra. Uh, unbelievable. The cops believe another war between Los Salidos and the Latin Kings is not far off. I don't think it's anything that's gone away over the last, you know, 10, 15 years. Right now, at this time, we're back into that beginning cycle where we saw the wars back in the early days. And the sign that we're looking at back here, the war sign, is uh, the Salidos declaring war on the Latin Kings. Um, it's kind of one of those things where when they drive by it, they see it, they understand what it means. They know that now it's time, it's open season on the Latin Kings based on all the retaliation and all the incidents that have happened. Authorities know this means new challenges for them. 
police have to change. They have to change and learn different ta tactics to get them. The old stuff we used to do may not work uh, for the experienced gang member. They won't be as out in the open or in your face. We'll be doing all the stuff they did before, they'll just try to be quieter. But they want to reassert their, their independence on the street and be the predominant gang in Hartford again. Not everyone is up for another round. Some Los Salidos members, like Pipe's brother, Waneka, say they're through with gang life. My daughter was born, and I had something for, to live for. My brother's kids, and could have got killed, and somehow, some way, uh, I didn't end up getting killed. Big Bird has also left the gang. He says he was tired of people getting killed over a war nobody was winning. Now stop this. We got to go the right way. We got to educate these brothers and sisters so we can have a trade or something like that that can fall back. After his 1997 conviction, Smurf spent 18 months behind bars. There, he vowed to change his life. I had done enough, you know, I had, uh, but seeing what I saw in jail, seeing people getting stabbed, in my heart, I, that's not how I wanted to be. Every day, he is reminded of his past. What this is, is a, it's a memorial area for victims of violence in the city. It's like here it says, one way you die like a soldier, but it's kind of like dying like a punk. Because you're representing all the wrong things when you die in the street. There is also a stone there for fallen brother Pipe Santana. This stone tells you like what he said he would do, and this is exactly what he did. And he died because of this. This this thought. It says if anybody ever comes to me with a gun, I'm just gonna shut up and walk away. He, he knew that. He knew he didn't want it anymore. But that ended up costing him his life. Smurf is back on the streets now and uses his smooth talking to counsel at risk youth. Primarily uh, violence prevention and gang prevention, giving kids an opportunity to go from where they're at to something positive. Smurf left Los Salidos with the gang's blessing, but he still feels the pull of his old life. I'm not free from gang, from, from the gang life. When, you, when you're down with something like that, it's, it's always there. It's, almost, it's impossible to get away from it. That life found Smurf again. He and his older brother, Efren, his best friend since childhood, had been in Los Salidos together. In January 2008, Efren was shot dead on the street. My brother was here for a party. While he was there, a, a gentleman got arrived there who had problems with one of my brother's friends, and one thing led to the other, and uh, they got into a fight right out here. Uh, the fight escalated into something else. The guys left. As he was walking, he was talking to his friend about where he wanted to go, and the person drove up. They were talking while the guy was in the car because they knew each other. They were both solid. They were both in the same, they were both in the same game. You know I mean, pulled out the gun, came up close to him. My brother put his hands up. He told him not to shoot, and uh, got shot him. He went to the hospital and. Uh, he lost, he lost, I lost him, I lost him. You're talking about the single most important man in my life. The suspect in Efren's death is a Los Salidos member convicted in the murder of little seven-year-old Marcelina Delgado. He recently finished a 12-year prison sentence for that crime. That taught me my brother's death, is that no matter what you do, you're never safe. That's as true today as it's ever been. With another gang war all but certain, Los Salidos seem ready to repeat the gang's deadly cycle. The future for Salidos right now, prison and death. You're either gonna get killed, or you're gonna, you're gonna end up in prison. People are gonna die, and there's no need for it. We can do better than that.